Thank you. You may be seated. All right, very good. As Brother Mike makes his way over to the piano, uh, take your Bibles to John chapter number 2, if you would. John chapter number 2. And then uh, and also, also another prayer request that I failed to mention, uh, forgive me, <clears throat> is that uh, many of us uh, know who uh, Brother Randy Barton is and uh, Miss Verna's uh, son. Uh, Brother Randy had suffered a heart attack. Um, I, I can't... I, I, I fail to remember when he had it, but they had flown him to Greeley, I believe, and so it looks like he's going to be having some bypass surgery. I don't know on what scale, what level it might be, so continue to pray for uh, Randy Barton if you would. All right, John chapter number two is where we're going to be this morning. Oh, once Brother Mike is finished with this morning's special, well, let's give attention to God's Word and we'll get into the preaching. Brother Mike, sir. <laughs> Take your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2 this morning. <clears throat> John chapter number 2. Uh, continue going on through this uh, Sunday morning series, uh, going through the Gospel of John. So if you're there and you're physically able, let's all join Brother Dave and let's all stand. We're the reading of God's Word this morning. He, I mean, he, did, he, he was standing up before I was standing up, I'm sure. So, John chapter number 2, uh, begin reading verse First of all, is God good? He is good. All right. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith do unto you, do it. And there were 
and they were there, six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man of the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This morning's message is a pretty simple message, it's, or a title, it's this. Fill your water pots to the brim. Fill your water pots to the brim. Let's pray, and then you can be seated. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this morning. Lord, th- Lord thank you for the good spirit that we have this morning. Lord, that's a blessing. Father, it's a blessing just to see people, Father, being able to fellowship with smiles and laughter and joy. And, and Lord, thank you, Lord, for the music that we're able to sing out unto you, dear God. And Lord, just hearing people praise your name. Lord, it's a wonderful thing. Lord, I ask you that you just be with us now, Lord. Father, as we first want to set that time aside of our service, Lord, to direct it towards you, Father, the singing, the praising of your name. But Lord, now it's the, the latter part of the service is directed to us, Lord. And Father, we even need you even more in, during this time. Lord, I pray that you just help us, dear God, to hear from you. Challenge us, Lord, through your word. Help us to love you more and that we might fill our water pots to the brim. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I think it's important that, not, not, not just Christians, but people, individuals, should do hard things. I think it's important that we do hard things. Right? Okay. Okay. (laughs) I I think we'll agree this. We don't like to do hard things. They're hard. We don't want to do things that are hard. I think it's important that we do hard things. And so, by just way of introduction, uh, I googled why it's important to do hard things. Now, I'm not saying I got the message off Google, okay? So don't run with that. Okay. All right. That's dangerous. But I had to Google, why is it important to do hard things? I just wanted to see what Google had to say. I mean, we Google everything else, pretty much, for crying out loud. Uh, so I Googled uh, why we should do hard things. And, and one of the first results that I clicked on, it says eight reasons why uh, you should do hard things. And reason number one is this, and, and I agree with many of these, by the way. And so it says you will grow as a person, number one. Number two, you will become a better person. Number three, you will stand out. Number four, you will be healthier. Number five, you will become smarter. Many of us need that part. (laughs) Number six, you will be more productive. Number seven, you will be valued. Number eight, number eight, last one, you will be happier. Now, I'm I'm sure some of these have some truth to them, and some of them have some credibility, and, and to some extent, for sure. But listen. In the Christian life, we're often called to do hard things, aren't we? Now, the Christian life is an easy life, but sometimes, really, the Christian life is an easy life in this, obedience. That's it. But sometimes in that obedience, it causes us to make some difficult decisions, and it could be, be kind of hard. But listen, the result of what gets accomplished as a result of us as Christians doing hard things, it has... Uh, nothing to do with what we did, okay? As Christians, when we do hard things, the results of it have nothing to do with what we did and has everything to do with who he is, okay? So, as believers, we don't do hard things uh, for, uh, for our benefit, even though it does benefit us when we do hard things for his name's sake. And we do hard things to really for his glory, we are going uh, to see uh, Jesus in this passage. He's going to ask some servants to do some hard things. Difficult tasks. Not easy tasks, some difficult tasks. Now, Jesus and others closest to him, they were invited to a wedding here in this passage. Uh, the, the wedding was held in Cana of Galilee in verses number 1 and 2. Look at your Bibles, if you would. It, it's important that we at Calvary Baptist Church have our Bibles in front of us. 
Uh, I, I, don't want, I just don't want you to leave here saying, well, some preacher said. No, no, no. I want us to look and say, this is what God's word says here at Calvary Baptist Church. So verse number one and two, it says, in the third day, there was a marriage of Cana and Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So we can see from this verse that Jesus, he did have disciples at this time. Now, this was still very, very, very early on in his ministry, so he didn't have all 12 as of yet. Uh, but what we do uh, kind of believe, or what commentators say, is that he may have had upwards to six already, uh, uh, could later get up to 12. But what we do see is that Jesus, he was a little bit different than John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he was more so of being a recluse, right? He, John the Baptist was more so of being uh, out in the wilderness, man of God, for sure. But he, he was more kept to himself. Jesus, on the other hand, was very, very sociable. He was around people. He often attended public events. And we don't know the relation as to Jesus in regards to who got married. I mean, we could assume that this young couple could have been a young couple, could have been an old couple. We don't know. This, well, just for sake of the, the message this morning, it's a young couple. And for the sake of the young couple, it could have been a family, uh, friends of the family, could have been relatives of Mary. It, it could have been cousins. We, we don't really know for sure. But what we do know is Jesus attended. What do we get from that? Jesus is all for marriage. Amen. <laughs> hey, it's a wise thing to invite Jesus to your marriage. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not the message, but I, you really want Jesus to be a part of your marriage for sure. Now, as Jesus and his disciples, uh, they were there and they're fellowshipping, having a good time at the, the marriage there, and maybe shaking hands with a young couple, embracing one another, having a good time, uh, there was a shortage of wine at the wedding. Now, running out of wine in our culture is not, well, first of all, let's consider, let's redefine this real quick, okay? Grape juice. <laughs> Grape juice. Now, running out of wine in this culture would have been a very major social mistake. It would have been a very big deal. I mean, a wedding in, in this day and age is a very big deal. Now, weddings are a big deal here. I mean, uh, weddings are a very important day. I mean, for, for a wedding to happen, it's the young lady's big day. Right? It, it's, it's her big day. It's her moment. It's something that she's dreamt about ever since she was a little girl. And, and maybe she was a flower girl, and ever since then that she saw the, the beautiful bride in her big white dress, and she thought, oh, maybe one day I get to do that. And so it's a very, very big day in our culture for the ladies. You know, they're, they're excited to get married, and, and they're, they're looking forward to that day. There's the, the, she's saying, I, I waited my whole life to be called Mrs. Flores. No? Okay. She didn't even laugh or anything. But we would all agree. It's a big day. It's a big day. Now, it's a big day in their day as well. However, if we go to a wedding reception and we run out of punch, it's no big deal. We're out of punch. They go to a wedding and they run out of refreshments. They run out of drinks. They run out of food. Hey, this is, this, something like that is dishonorable. And something like that could haunt this newlywed for the remainder of their marriage. Now to us, we think, no big deal. But to them, it was a very, very serious thing. And so Mary, she comes to Jesus, and look, notice in verse number three, she says, and they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Now, Brother Richard, is Jesus in favor of social drinking? Hey, I think we already clear, clarified that. This is grape juice. Now, people, okay, uh, all right, I'm taking a little bit of a time out here. The world likes to use this verse to try to condone alcohol consumption. The world really try, tries to use this verse, and, and I like what Warren Wiersbe said. He says this, a man uh, given to drink once said to me, now this is Wiersbe speaking, once said to me, after all, Jesus turned water into wine. Wiersbe replied, if you use Jesus as your example for drinking, why don't you follow his example for everything else? <laughs> Mary wanted Jesus to do something to supply the need. Hey, think of, 
at this point, Jesus had not done a single miracle. He's never done a miracle in his entire life. He's 30 years old here at this point, and he's never done a single miracle. But yet here is Mary. She's going to Jesus, and she says, hey, I know you can supply the need. I know you can supply that. Um, now, notice what Jesus said in verse number 4. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour, my hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. Now, when we first read that in verse number 4, we think to ourselves that, this, that Jesus' response is harsh, kind of disrespectful. I, I mean, in our culture, we speak to our mothers and we say, Woman, I'm not even going to look in this direction right now. I mean, if, if any of my kids speak to my wife and say, woman, they're going to say that only one time. If I say, woman, <laughs> you need a new pastor because this one's dead. <laughs> I, I mean, we say the word woman and we think, oh, that's, that's rude. That's harsh. You shouldn't speak like that to your mother. You, you shouldn't call your mother a woman. Hey, but, 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 but understand, I mean, this is a culture. This is a different day and age here. And then, but if someone were to say woman, it, it, it's different. It's like this, my lady. There's a difference there, isn't there? My lady. Woman, my lady. And, and so when Jesus is saying woman, he's not being derogatory toward, towards his mother. He's not doing that. I mean, Jesus even called her a woman when he was hanging from the cross. Remember that? He, he's on the cross. He says, woman, behold thy son. Remember that? He, he's basically telling this, this other gentleman, says, hey, take care of my mama for me as he's hanging on the cross. Take care of my lady for me. Take care of this dear lady for me, if you would. So Jesus, he's not being disrespectful here. He's not being ugly towards his mother when he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. But wh when he says, when my hour is not yet come, he's having to remind Mary and saying this, my lady, mother, my lady, you need to remind yourself of this. I'm not here according to your times table. I'm here according to my father's. And, and, and Mary, she didn't take resentment towards that because she knew. I don't know why I keep looking at my mom when I'm saying this. <laughs> I'm going over here. I'm looking at Brother Dave. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but she knew. She, she knew who Jesus was. Mary wasn't resentful. Mary wasn't the one to say, how dare you speak to me that way? Don't you know who raised you? Don't you remember who fed you? Don't you remember who cleaned you? Don't you remember? She, I mean, she, Mary didn't throw down the mom card. I'm just saying. She didn't do that. But Jesus, he's just kindly reminding her and saying, I'm not here according to your schedule. I'm here according to my father's schedule. Mine hour has not yet come. And, and we don't see any resentment from Mary throughout the passage here. And this is what we do see Mary doing. She ends up going to the servants, and then this is what she says. Uh, look at verse number uh, 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. It's like Jesus had to say, hold on, hold on, Mom. Hold on. I'm not here according to your time schedule. I'm here according to my father's time schedule. And it's like Mary had to say, oh, yes, I remember now. I remember. I just saw a need, but I know that you're the one who can supply the need. And so there's the service, and then this is what she says. Hey, whatever he says to do, you best do it. You best do it. Hey, that's good counsel from Mary. I, I mean, that, that, that right in and of itself will preach a good while. Hey, Calvary Baptist Church, whatever he says to do, we best do it. Absolutely. Mary had the solution, but she just needed to understand that it, it's not according to her time schedule. It's according to the Father's time schedule. And then, then we see that Jesus, he gave the servants a hard task. There were six water pots that Jesus was going to use to meet the need in verse number 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone. Look there, verse 6. After the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins a piece. Now, what's a firkin? Well, a firkin was a measuring system used back then. And in today's measurements, a single firkin is about nine gallons. Nine gallons. There's six water pots, two to three firkins a piece there. And then in verse number seven, Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. 
Now, depending on how they filled these water pots, it w- this is what it would have done. It would have taken time, and it would have been very difficult. I mean, in our home, we have a, a five-gallon jug of water. And, and that's, that's our drinking water. And, and every, when it gets empty, it's my job to go out, fill it, and bring it home, and, and to put it back on the, the spout thingamajig. You know what I'm talking about by thingamajig. Everybody understands what thingamajig meant, all right? But here's the thing. When that thing's empty, my kids like to throw that thing up in the air. My kids like to play with that thing. Just a plastic jug. They like to punch it, beat on it, do whatever to it. And, and, but when it's full, they don't want to touch it. You know why they don't want to touch it? Because they can't move it. Five gallons has got some weight to it. Hey, these water pots were stone. There were stone. There were stone and there were empty already. And Jesus tells them, I want you to take these water pots and I want you to fill them. Now, uh, two to three firkins a piece. I mean, some of these water pots, we're looking at 18 gallons. Some of these water pots, we've got 27 gallons. Now, 27 gallons, hauling a, 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 a stone water pot around, 27 gallons full of water, that's not an easy task. And that's not easy at all. Or it, it, maybe they could have just left the water pots there and they would have went to a water source and maybe they could have had different smaller buckets or cups or whatever and they would have brought it back and they would have eventually filled it. Either way, there's time and there's a lot of effort taking place there. And it, but notice what they said. The Bible says that they filled the water pots all the way to the top, to the, to the brim there. It, basically, this is... Jesus told, or Mary said, whatever that my son says to do, you do it. And they listened to that counsel and they said, yes, ma'am. And what they did is that they filled the water pots as high as they could possibly go. There there was no room for for anybody to say, well, you you can fill it a little bit more. You can pour more water in there. Yeah, there's still some more room. No, no, no. They went all the way to the top. They, in other words, they obeyed him as much as possible. How about that? a lot of hard work. The Bible doesn't say how they filled it. it. Just We can just conclude it took a lot of effort to fill that many gallons. I mean, we're, we're talking this much, about 150 to 160 gallons of water. A lot of water. But listen to this. Jesus wanted them to do the hard task of filling the water pots so that he can give them impossible results. He wanted them to serve the governor of the feast. Look at verse number 8. He saith unto them, Draw out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Now, who's the governor of the feast? Well, the governor of the feast was one who would be responsible for providing a lot of the meal, providing some of the, in, uh, some of the entertainment for the guest. That's who the governor of the feast would be. Now, look at verse number 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the, drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. So the governor tasted this wine. He didn't know it was water. He just assumed, hey, you kept the good stuff for last. I mean, the stuff that you've been reserving is better than the stuff that we've originally served here. And this miracle, this, uh, church, listen, this is a very private miracle. This is private. Only a very few select people knew about this miracle. Uh, uh, You had the servants, you had the disciples, wasn't even all 12 at the time, and you had Jesus there. Now, look at verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And when the Bible says that he manifested his glory, this is what he's doing. It means that he's just revealing an, uh, uh, this much of his power. It's what he was doing. He's just showing, hey, this is what I'm capable of. This is what I'm able to do. And because he did that, he revealed once again to his disciples that he really is the Savior. And he really is the Messiah. 
But he wanted the servants to do hard work to show them that he's capable of doing the impossible. Well, what's that have to do with us? Hey, listen. And I'm going to be done here soon. I, I really didn't plan on being long this morning. I know, I know Pastor Young says that, but, and he's a liar and he don't mean it. <laughs> I really don't plan on being long here. I'm sorry, Pastor Young, if you're watching this. <laughs> hey, the Christian life, Lord, might ask us to do some pretty hard things. Lord might ask us to do some things that really don't make sense to us. Hey, these servants, you really think it made sense to them? We need wine. Okay, go fill it with water. Huh? That, it didn't make sense to them, I'm sure. But this is what we, what we don't see from the, those servants there. They didn't complain. They didn't question. They didn't argue. They didn't say, well, this makes no sense. We're going through all this effort, and we don't even know why. All we know why is just because Mary told us to obey him, so that's what we're going to do. No, no, they didn't see any of that. Hey, the Christian life, you know, the Lord just might ask us or lay something on our hearts that might not make a whole lot of sense to us. But really, this is what he wants us to do. He wants us to obey because he can use our obedience and show us something that we thought was impossible. Usually when the Lord asks us to do something, it's going to require faith to do what he asks us to do. And, and I'll be honest with you, hey, I'm guilty of this as well. The Lord asked me to do something, and I tried to rationalize why I shouldn't do it. I try to rationalize and say, well, that don't make sense. I try to rationalize, well, now's not a good time. I try to rationalize and say, well, like, well I know I'm supposed to. I know the Lord wants me to give a track to this person right now, but to be quite honest with you, it's in the middle of the work day. We're supposed to be focused on work and, and, and all these distractions. And so, no, 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 now's not a good time. And really what the Lord just wants me to do, what he wants us to do, is just fill our water to the brim. Obey him as much as we possibly can. Don't ask questions. Don't question God. Don't complain about it. Just obey him and just trust him with the results. Hey, uh, I'm thankful for this church. I, I really am thankful. For this. Hey, I'm thankful for the heritage of this church. I am. And, and to be honest with you, church family, I've, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of stories of the good old days of Calvary Baptist Church. I've heard a lot of glory days of Calvary Baptist Church. I've heard how church, Calvary Baptist Church used to have three or four buses at one time and, and they used to bring in children just by the dozens and bring them in by the bus loads and then I, I pray for men like Brother Tam who would have to deal with that. Okay. But, but seriously, we, we, I've heard of glory days and, I, and I've heard how people would be here a, a lot and, and, and just hear all these wonderful stories of Calvary Baptist Church. But, but Calvary Baptist Church today, hey, listen, those, those days of the past, they don't have to remain in the past. The, the, those glory days, they don't have to remain there. Hey, the glory days can still be up ahead. The best days of Calvary Baptist Church can still be in our future. But, but this is the thing, Calvary Baptist Church. What we're going to have to do is listen to the counsel that Mary gave these servants. Whatever he says to do, do it. Whatever he says to do, obey it. And obey it to the fullest. Hey, if, if, when the Lord asks us to do stuff, it's going to require time and it's going to require work. Those servants, there was a lot of time and there was a lot of work. And we might say to ourselves, well, the glory days of Calvary Baptist Church, it's impossible for Calvary Baptist Church today to be like the Calvary Baptist Church of yesteryear. It's impossible for us to run those numbers again. It's impossible to have the fellowship again. It's impossible to do, for it to be like the way it used to be. It's impossible for us to finally update the building. It's impossible for us to have a, a good outreach. It's impossible for us to, uh, to soul win in this day and age where everyone seems so cold and everyone seems so cut off to the gospel. It's impossible. Hey, how about we just stop complaining and just do what the Lord tells us to do and we just trust him with the results. How about we stop rationalizing on why we can't or why we shouldn't and just start doing it? 
And if we just start doing it, and we just start following Jesus, and start obeying what the Word of God says, and what it means for a local church to go out and to preach the gospel, and to teach, and to baptize, and to disciple, how about, if we just follow, I don't know, God's recipe for the local church, let's just trust God for the results here. Let's just trust Him that, well, that He's going to turn our water into wine. He's going to turn our water into grape juice. But this is what we must be willing to do, Calvary Baptist Church. We must be doing, we must be willing to do the work to fill our water to the brim. Say, Lord, you called us to be disciples. You called us to disciple people. You called us to reach people. You called us to share the gospel. All right, Lord, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to make the gospel priority here at Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to make soul winning a priority at Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to make your word the authority of Calvary Baptist Church. Hey, I know I'm the pastor of parent, and come January, I'm going to be the official pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church. And, and yes, I understand that there's some spiritual leadership, and that's biblical, but understand this. the authority, Listen, this is not my church. That is not my pulpit. That is not your pew. That is not your seat. God just lets us have it. God just lets us use it. God just allows us to use it so that we can accomplish His work. But here's the thing. We got to be willing to work. We got to be willing to fill our water pots to the brim and not leave any room. Hey, it, it might require sacrificing a Saturday morning. It might require coming to church a little bit earlier. It might require staying a little bit later. It might require you sticking out like a sore thumb at work and having a godly testimony when everybody else doesn't. It might require those types of things. But church family, I want to encourage us this morning that we serve a God who is able to do things that we think are impossible. We think, nah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ever see Calvary Baptist Church running three buses ever again. I don't ever see that happening. Yeah, we did in the past, and that was good, and that was great. That was wonderful. Boy, oh boy, that we have, boy, do we have stories to tell. Well, I know this for sure. If we don't get busy filling our water pots, we won't have three buses. If we don't get busy filling our water pots and soul winning and telling other people about Jesus and the gospel be a stirring up, stirring up in our hearts, then we won't see new people. We won't see young couples. We, 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 we won't. We just won't, church. That's, that's basically very simple. We don't do the work. God won't bless. That's it. It's a very simple concept. But here's the thing. It's going to require our faith. It required those servants' faith. Okay. We're pouring buckets of water. The need is wine. I don't understand. But I'm going to do it anyways. Why? Because the Lord said so. That's why. Hey, we have his word. And his word gives us a commission. And his, war, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. His word is our direction. His word is our guidance. His word is everything. Are we willing to follow his word? Are we willing to obey him? And when we obey him, church, let's be willing to fill our water pots to the very, very top so God can bless. Hey, not just for the church. Hey, but fill your water pot in your marriage. Husbands, fill your water pot in your marriage and be the husband that God wants you to be to your very best. And watch God do something in your marriage. F fill your water pot at, at work. Have the testimony at work and watch God do something impossible at work. I never thought, I never ever thought my coworker would ever come to church. I never ever thought that. I would have deemed that impossible. Well, when you're faithful and you obey Him, He just has a way of just doing impossible things. He certainly does. So church, I, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you of not serving the Lord, but I'm asking you this. Are you serving the Lord by filling your water pots to the brim? Or are you saying, 
this is good enough. This is good enough. Ah, preacher will be happy with this much service. Ow. Lord knows why I, I, I can't visit. Lord knows why I shouldn't be mother. Lord knows why. I don't know. Let's fill our water pots to the brim. Let's serve the Lord the best that we can. Because when we serve Him the best that we can, He just has a way of making the impossible a reality. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, I thank You, Lord, for this day that You've given us. Lord, I pray, dear God, that You would just help, help us, Lord, as a church family. Lord, and may Calvary Baptist Church, Lord, just be a place, dear God, that we're willing to put the effort, we're willing to do the work. And Lord, I understand, Lord, that some of us can't do a 